Gitanjali, the rhythm pattern, the tune has been very, very familiar to common people. There is not much this jugglery and all. Very, very common tunes of people. People could easily communicate with these tunes, with these uh, words, and philosophically, it was much higher by then. Though we didn't find any reference of Rumi in Tagore's uh, writings, I, I searched for long, I asked a few Tagore um, Pandit that way, who we take that way, I mean, still we couldn't find any reference of Rumi, but still it is so very close, you know. And only one reference I could have there is one great poet in Bengal, Shankar Bush. Uh, he, uh, we, we of course uh, think that uh, right now he is almost one of the ultimate, who can say about take out the ultimate things among the few people those who are right now. So I found one line there in one of his books, Shankar Bush's book, there was one reference that uh, when uh, people were coming out from Etz's house after the reading of Gitanjali, one lady was there, uh, she was Evelyn Underhill, she was one mystic novelist, and she was uh, telling uh, the people who were accompanying her while coming out from Exos House that as if I could hear Rumi's poetry, that much of solace and peace I could find in this poetry. So that was the minimum possible reference I could find. I, I didn't find any other reference. I, I don't know if anybody can help me out in that way. I'm searching for it still. But uh, Hafiz's reference was very much there, of course. But, and now I, I, I must wrap up to this period, you know, and of course, because when it was 1913, when Chikor received Nobel Prize for Gitanjali, and uh, there, was, there is some interesting uh, things, I mean, dates, peculiar dates, uh, I mean, there is a sort of relation within. Tegu took birth in 1861 and died in 1941. And uh, Roma Rola, he took birth in 1866, so five years junior that way. And he died in 1944, so three years junior that way. And uh, they met in uh, 1919. And Tagore received Nobel in 1914, and uh, Rola received Nobel in 1915. And there was this great uh, First World War that actually was over by 1914. So it was post World War I mean, when. Europe was facing deep crisis and uh, Roland himself was one mystic that way, but somehow he was feeling that uh, void within and he was very much depressed and uh, I'm not reading out his pieces, you 
Of course, we all knew about it, uh, that he wrote to Tigor. Somehow, Tigor's poems uh, could uh, offer him deep solace in that way. And uh, he uh, could uh, feel that somehow India could uh, show the path uh, to the Europe, I mean, all of Europe, that is uh, suffering deeply uh, post-World War. So, uh, post-World War, now I am singing a song that was composed uh, yeah, when Tigor was 50. So just after receiving Nobel Prize, I mean, just during that time. So it was uh, one more uh, form that is very much close to this migrating music. This is Fado, a form uh, of Portuguese music. This form, I think, the Fado, the word means uh, nemesis that way, you know. Therein uh, lies some sort of negativity within when we say nemesis. So we have to accept it that way, so it isn't there. So uh, the African Moors, they were taken to uh, Portugal as a slave, and while coming, uh, I mean, uh, their, their feeling, the, the Moors, the way they felt, and uh, the song of the uh, people who were driving sheep and who were serving them beautifully as uh, they were taken uh, as uh, slaves, you know, so the way they were treated, we can very well understand that, uh, that uh, I mean, shame or grief or whatever, I mean, that, that sense of pathos and with it, this uh, monotonous rhythm of this long voyage, and uh, when finally they came to Portugal, this uh, uh, song of this uh, port area, all these things mingled together to form Fado. And nowadays it is sung in the uh, cafes of uh, Lisbon. It is now an urban folk song. And uh, this is actually the particular form uh, uh, that has taken this uh, mystic music, you know. Mystic music transformed into migrating music and finally to world music, this urban folk song. So this is um, one of the oldest kind of urban folk music, this Fado. I'm again trying to hum a bit of Fado. And um, this is the tradition that uh, it is sung, I mean the composition are very short, uh, three, four lines that way, and uh, uh, the artists assemble in one cafe and uh, from the, one of them they start singing, and from him uh, somebody else takes the cue, and that way it is phrased, and uh, this is the form. And um, the, so uh, from one song, we just glide to another song. We don't even uh, understand when we are gliding to. The thing is, uh, I, I could find two songs by Tigor. I mean, I was, of course, jammed by the uh, tune pattern and uh, the form of the music, and I was uh, rather. Uh, brought to this uh, two songs by Tigor. Then I didn't know that it was two songs, it were the two songs uh, by Tigor from this famous uh, play, Achulayatan, you know. That is also the song against the repression. That is the mool, I mean the main tune of Fado, uh, the song against oppression or repression. So these two songs are from Achulayatan. Let me some uh, hum a bit from Fado and then pass on to those two songs. Mm -hmm.
but it's the ultimate and the message of Upanishad is Charivriti. So this is the philosophy of poets, uh, I mean, Upanishad, poet of Rishi Upanishad and uh, this is the way he could uh, communicate with people and uh, I think that uh, we all know that the poet Tagore was of course uh, well known for his mystic approach about the world but uh, as composer also Tagore was of course I think that uh, almost complete in his approach I mean at par with the world famous composer to, to express his philosophy, his belief, to communicate his thoughts to the people. That's all. Thank you. Shankar has written something about Rumi and Rumi. Shankar hasn't written actually. He actually referred to uh, Evelyn Underhill, uh, Evelyn Underhill's uh, words, you know, in one of his books, uh, Shankar was, and this, the book is called A Amir Abudon. So, in the uh, introduction, Shankar was mentioned that uh, Evelyn Underhill was uh, feeling like uh, she was uh, listening to Ruby's poetry. Okay. Yeah. And Lorca, I mean, uh, there was an effect of Lorca on Tagore, or it was like. No, I don't uh, like to say that there is one effect of Lorca and Tigar. The thing is, uh, it was uh, the effect of gypsy, you know, gypsy music and gypsy philosophy on Lorca. And that is the same thing, I mean, this uh, effect of uh, mysticism and gypsy philosophy that actually um, had effect on Tigar. And when Tigar visit, uh, visited Persia, you know, uh, he uh, you know, wrote that uh, uh, the music of this place has uh, very common with, uh, yeah, common things with our music, so that we reflect. And uh, particularly, you know, the, the magic is uh, the Rag Bhairavi. We all know that Tagore composed, uh, I mean, uh, a lot of quite a number of uh, songs on this Rag Bhairavi. And the notes, combination of notes uh, that are used in Vairabi is very much common in Persian music. Uh, that is the cause of similarity with that way. And uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, there is a reason behind it, of course, why the similarity is there. Yes, yeah. And so, I mean, the last song, Nure Mutha, Nure Mutha, yeah. uh, uh, you're saying it's kind of a song against oppression. So, does it have a direct correlation with Padu? Uh, no, of course not. No, I, I have already tried to say that uh, there is no such direct relation. The thing That's is, so when the thoughts are reflected, the tunes are also reflected that way automatically. That is the thing. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, have I passed or any more questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>